The saga of George Santos is a political drama full of twists and turns that seem to take another page from another fictional Long Islander, The Great Gatsby. But this is no drama set in a novel. We are still learning more about the lies that the congressman told voters about his entire life. And at least eight House Republicans are now calling for Santos to quit. He insists, though, that he won't, but is refusing to answer questions from intrepid reporters like our very own Manu Raju. Why did you lie to your voters about your qualifications, your past, being Jewish? Why did you lie to them? Don't the voters deserve an explanation about your widespread lies about your past? How can you be trusted with sensitive security information, Mr. Santos? How can, you say, how can you say your voters elected you if they didn't know who they were electing? Are you gonna, have you been confident by the Brazilian authorities about the fraud charges you're facing? Mr. Sanders, why won't you respond to any of these questions about your past? The wait for that elevator to open is like the longest, like 15 <laughs> seconds of your entire life when you're running for Manu. Um, but Jonah, I mean, the reporting this weekend and uh, oh, oh, a, fr a Friday from the New York Times and CNN has confirmed this is that basically Republicans knew. Yeah. Um, uh, our Pamela Brown and Sonnet Swire write that there was trepidation among consultants and donors and Republicans that Santos wasn't telling the truth. And among those who were concerned, according to a source, was Dan Constan, the president of the Congressional Leadership Fund PAC, who is also a close associate of Kevin McCarthy's. So does that surprise you at all? Uh, it doesn't. I, at this point, I, I, I'm very difficult to surprise about any of this stuff. And, and, and I just want to say, in all props to, to Manu, who does a great job, it's now becoming sort of a man bites dog story about the lies. And it, soon we're going to hit the point of inflection where reporters are like, you know, Representative Santos, why did you tell the truth about this? Because it turns right. out like there, there are fewer, almost everything he says is not true. Lies yeah. At this point. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think, uh, as we've talked about before, a lot of these dynamics, our system but at, at scale and also sort of institutionally is not well designed for very close ties, very close elections, going from the floor to recount all the way up to Congress. And when the, the majority of the House hinges on essentially four votes, you just have a much higher tolerance for jackassery than you normally would. If Kevin McCarthy had 30 seat majority, uh, Santos's future would be much easier to predict. But these guys, they thought every vote counted. They knew the red wave wasn't actually coming. And so they had a much higher tolerance for, you know, a political fraud. Dating back even to the campaign, potentially, which means, I mean, honestly, that seems like a bit of, they're kind of complicit in the deception of voters, don't you think? Well, I think this is another example that we saw in the midterms of Republicans having a candidate quality issue. And they knew that for candidate months. Candidate quality, the word of the year. Yeah. And so, but Two words of the year. Republicans <laughs> decided they had to go with, what, with the candidates that they had. And I think once Republicans saw that the writing was on the wall, that Santos would be the Republican nominee for this seat that they wanted because they knew their majority was going to be slim, they stuck beside them. And we saw that with numerous candidates in both the House and the Senate. Now, of course, he's probably on the more extreme version, but think about um, Herschel Walker on very uh, somewhat similar terms as far as lying about his resume and having a lot of problematic things on his resume. And the party still stuck beside him because they wanted him to win because they wanted the seat. And, and they got it. And they, they got the seat. And in some ways, I don't know, maybe they didn't expect it. This is a Biden district. I mean, it's not actually a heavily Republican-leaning district. It's interesting to me, Eli, that all of these Republicans in New York who consider themselves majority makers, uh, who flipped seats, many of them, uh, are really the ones who are out front saying this guy has got to go. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. The White House has looked at these races and they've said, okay, these are the Republicans that we think we're going to go to and talk to and say you're going to need to be with us on some bipartisan things if you want to get reelected because you're in a district that the president carried. Um, and George Santos is, obviously, is, is an easy one for a lot of these people, given everything that has come out. Um, and, you know, but the funny thing is that I had some initial conversations with people in the White House, and they were talking about George Santos as someone that maybe we can work with because maybe Republicans knew about this. I'm not sure the White House did. And Santos, because he'll say anything, had said some things um, that were yes, I'm open to working with this administration on some things. And so there was actually some optimism about working with him, whereas now, you know, he's just a complete laughing stock. Yeah, I mean, he was he was making a name for himself because he was like a kind of unconventional Republican. It just turns out that most of that stuff 
wasn't true. Uh, but this is the interview from this past week that raised a lot of eyebrows. He's confronted about a critical part of this, which is where he got all of his money. Listen. One of the principal critiques I've heard is that a lot of money uh, was donated to your campaign by you, 700000 I believe. Where did it come from? Well, I'll tell you where it didn't come from. It didn't come from China, Ukraine, or Burisma. Is there anything else you can say about uh, the work you did that was the origin of, of those resources? Look, I've, I've worked my entire life. I've lived an honest life. I've never been uh, uh, accused, sued, of, of any bad doing. So, you know, it's it's my, it's the equity of my hard working self and I, I've invested inside of me. I, I, I've, <laughs> I've invested in, inside of me myself, but, but I don't. Just look at this, uh, look at what we're talking about here in terms of his finances. Back in 2020, we have evidence that he made about $55,000 from LinkBridge investors. Fast forward to 2022, you're talking $750,000 from his DeVolder organization. And then if you look at a list of assets, which he had none in 2020, potentially millions of dollars. I mean, these are real serious questions. And I invested in myself is not going to cut it as an answer. Yeah, and, and news flash to Mr. Santos. You have been accused of some bad doing. I don't know if you've been reading the, the headlines, but uh, no, I think that clearly every day it feels like we are getting more and more lies uh, from the congressman and more, frankly, just sketchy stories about him. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, there is no real mechanism right now that can be triggered for him to resign. Uh, what would need to happen is uh, Republicans around him would basically need to call on him to resign in mass. Uh, we have no indication that we're at that point yet. Or I think the stories, accusations, lies about him would just need to be fundamentally different. Like, for example, he gets, again, just as an example, he gets convicted of some crimes uh, back in Brazil or something like that, uh, where the Republican Party decides this guy is no longer just an embarrassment, but he is really a serious stain on the party and could affect our own chances of re-election, for example, two years from now. And that's just not where we are right it's now. It's not happening. He's getting his committee assignments. McCarthy has basically said... Uh, he can work his way back to redemption in the House of Representatives. 